Um, well, as we get started, uh, the first question I'd like to ask you is, it sounds like you've got an interesting journey in terms of discerning a call to pastoral ministry. Um, how, do you, how do you go from Berkeley um, to, to pastoral ministry, the Juris Doctor degree to, to, to pastoral ministry? How did you discern a call into pastoral ministry? My uh, father is a pastor. He's been pastoring for 36 years, just retired. Last year, I'm a PK. Uh, all my best friends were pastors and all these types of things. All my life, people, growing up, people used to tell me, you look like a preacher, <laughs> all these types of things. But I <laughs> summarily, summarily rejected all of that because I had seen a whole lot of things uh, in ministry in terms of how people treated my father and mm. then in uh, whereas my father is a man of integrity, I saw other uh, ministries because I was allowed to get up close where I saw some things that I felt uh, were not right. And so even though probably years before I, I, I acknowledged or uh, sort of surrendered to the call, I sort of felt a burden, <clears throat> um, sort of a, a, a gnawing feeling uh, that God really wanted me to do uh, something special as related to his people. And I just tried to uh, get away from it. And part of my, part of the reason I went to law school, I said, well, you know, I'll just be a lawyer. I can help people that way. <laughs> and uh, strange that last semester of law school, a pastor friend of mine, uh, we were walking in the church one day, and he just stopped and looked at me and just started laughing. And I said, well, what you laughing about? He said, it'd be mighty funny if God would allow somebody to go through four years of college, get through, you know, two and a half years of law school, and then just when they graduate, <coughs> call them to ministry. And he started laughing. And I said, man, that ain't funny. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and so it, it became increasingly obvious from within the body, people could see different uh, gifts in me that, you know, I just kept running, but then after I uh, graduated from law school, went back to my hometown, which is not hometown, but where my parents live, Kankakee, Illinois, and started practicing there. Um, just that that burden, I mean, it was almost like birth pains. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it would come in waves where I could just feel literally uh, the hand of God on me, pressure to really focus in on his word and administering his word. And so finally, September the 29th, 1988, uh, there was a pastor named uh, Manuel Scott, who's uh, dead now. Dr. Manuel Scott was a tremendous uh, African-American preacher. He happened to be in town, and he preached a sermon at my father's church called uh, Going Home Another Way from Matthew, where it talks about the uh, wise men came and saw the Christ, and the angel warned them to go back another way. He preached that sermon, and I couldn't take it anymore. I, went publicly before the church acknowledged my call to ministry and you know started that whole process. After acknowledging the call, I went away to went back to the Bay Area to go to the seminary and then came back to Illinois after seminary to assist my father. I was an administrative assistant for my father, who's a pastor, for about eight years. Finally had to let that go because and then go into just straight full time ministry because uh, one day I was in court, I was arguing a case uh, for this judge, and instead of saying, Your Honor, I said, Dear Lord. <laughs> and so I didn't recognize what I had said. And everybody in the, uh, everybody in the courtroom just fell out laughing. You know? Like, you know, what happened? And the judge was all red. And, you know, I said, Well, what, what's it going on, Judge? He said, Well, you know, you owe me deference, but not that much deference. <laughs> And I still didn't know. He said, you called me dear Lord. And I said, Lord. And I started recognizing, man, I was spending so much time uh, at the law office thinking about scripture and trying to get sermons together. I was being unfair both to the ministry and to my law partners. And so I finally went into full-time ministry and ultimately wound up in Rockford, where I'm very pleased uh, to be. I'm the third pastor in 85 years at the church where I'm pastor. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Could you tell us a little bit about your church? Your the church where I pastor, again, is 85 years old. The first pastor stayed there 40 years. The second one, like 38, 39 years. 
if I don't do 25, they're gonna consider me a punk or something. So <laughs> I'm pretty much there for the duration. It is a <clears throat> Rockford, it's about 150 or 55,000 people of the congregation I serve is about 290 families, uh, something like that. Uh, my predecessor, his name was Dr. Claybert Salter. Uh, the street is named after him. Uh, his, he's been dead for about three years now. His name is Steel Gold. I mean, politicians quote him. You know, the mayor would say like, yeah, like Dr. Salter used to say. Uh, he had that type of impact uh, in the community. I have a, a lot of elderly people in my church and a lot of babies. Um, and I have strange elders. What I mean by that is the elderly people in my congregation, I, I made the mistake like the first year I got there. Uh, you know, I noticed there were a lot of older women. I said, okay, well, everybody that's uh, 60 years old and older, and you're a woman, you're a pastor, sweetie. I'm a, you know, we're going to go out, we're going to do stuff together. And so I said, I, I want all the older ladies, I'm going to take you out to dinner. Man, we had to rent out the biggest. <laughs> um, facility in Rockford, we had like, we had six, at this time, there were six or seven ladies who were over 85, there were like 11 between 75 and 85, and I, I didn't count the ones like between 60 and 75. And my oldest member just died um, about three weeks ago, she was 98 years old, uh, still paying her tithes, still praying for other people. The second oldest just moved uh, to another community, still sends her tithes, and still calls, still prays for people. So I've been blessed with a congregation where the older people are really the movers and shakers. If I say, okay, well, we're gonna start small groups. Okay, let's go. Well, we're gonna do this. I mean, they're right there. If I say, okay, well, we're gonna have a chicken fight. Well, what kind of chickens do, you, do we need? <laughs> it's the younger generation that is sort of hard to get uh, motivated. I'm talking about young adults. Got a ton of kids, you know, so we're blessed in that regard. Yeah. That's it. That is the issue. Well, um, question two. Um, our students are really interested in sociological, cultural trends that maybe are on the horizon that will impact how people do ministry. It seems like we spend a lot of time today in evangelism thinking about these sorts of trends. But in, in your daily ministry, what are some trends that you're noticing? And culture that you think are really having an impact on on how you do ministry and you say you know you should be paying attention to this one of them is the unwillingness to make a commitment by um, a certain segment of the population what I mean by that is the older generation I'm talking about 55, 60 and older, the word commitment means something different to them than the ones who are like, say, between 25 and 45. And so, again, like I said, the two oldest members I had, one was 98, the other was 97, neither one of them, because of uh, physical frailty, had been in the sanctuary, say, for the past two or three years, but their tithes come every week. I have some other people, young adults, who would say in their 30s, got two jobs, big houses, big cars, and in terms of commitment, is lacking. I'm not saying they're bad people, but there's a different concept of commitment. And so that has tremendous implications for uh, finances, for uh, trying to actually do long-term ministry. And I'll give you a perfect example. There's a church in Rockford, uh, Right now, they just got a teaching pastor uh, last year, but up until last year, uh, and you were taking this, it doesn't make any difference. The pastor's my friend. We, we eat lunch together, but uh, the name of the church is Heartland Church. Their motto is a different way to do church. Up until last year, instead of having a live preacher, they would have Bill Hybels tapes. And so when it came time to worship, you know, they put in a tape or whatever. When it comes to ministry, and here's, here's my point. When it comes to ministry, I, I went to the church. And I said, well, let's partner. Let's do some things here in the community as it relates to the educational system, which everybody recognizes is way out of whack. And uh, the pastor shared with me. He said, well, 
He said, we can't do that, because I was talking about mentoring. That's like my thing. So let's, let's, just give me 300 volunteers, because they have like 7,000 members. Give me 300 volunteers, we'll go on the schools, every volunteer get three kids, we'll spend an hour a week mentoring the kids, and we can really, we can make it a tipping point, we can really turn the tide. He said, it's a great idea, he said, but we couldn't do it. I said, why? He said, because we can do great big one day event, but anything that's long term, that's just not in the DNA of our congregation. And I think that's typical. Now, they do a lot of great stuff like it's, you know, one day, but in terms of like ongoing something that we would call in my generation ongoing discipleship, now you can forget that. Why? Because there's this, there's a collective attention deficit disorder. People can't concentrate on anything for any long period of time. So even uh, the way the news is broadcast, the way we process the news, you know, whether it be uh, tsunamis someplace else in the world, or whether it be even uh, Katrina here, or earthquakes, or some, uh, we can't concentrate on anything long enough to actually have an impact on it, you know, within the context of the body of Christ. And I think that that's uh, sociologically, that's, that has tremendous implications for how we do ministry. I think another thing is uh, just this whole, um, this whole, this ties into the attention deficit disorder, this whole Blackberry, Twitter, <laughs> the, I mean, to Facebook, you know, um, instant message, that whole mentality has uh, impacted our culture in such a way that some people, some ministries are trying to go with the flow. Um, but then I think that there's some dangers inherent with that because if I'm understanding scripture correctly, and this is why I was talking about the disciplines early, earlier, there comes a time where for there to be actual an actual renewing of the mind that transforms, that that can't be, how can I say this? It's gonna take more than a few milliseconds. You're gonna to have to actually take some time to sit down and concentrate on one thing. And I think that, I think that one of the trends I see in ministry is ministers preaching in a way to try to accommodate the culture in terms rather than trying to transform the culture. And it's it's not a it's not a anthropological issue, that is to say, well people are just this way, because there's other cultures where and I'm I'm sure uh, those who traveled out of uh, the country to Africa or various other places, there are other cultures where man, if you just preach an hour, they say, Well you ain't serious. You haven't really gotten into the text. <laughs> you know, you can preach three or four hours you know, in certain other countries, and people are still starving for more. So it's not something inherent within how we're made, it's how we are being conditioned. And I think at some point, we got to be careful about how we, how we manage that, how we manage technology. Now, I'm a technology guy. I mean, I'm a Mac person. You know, we're Mac from way back. <laughs> Those of you who are still uh, PC, you know, the local doors you, of the church. I'll give you the secret handshake later. The so. <laughs> of the church will accept you by Mactism uh, <laughs> so that you can come on up. So I'm not anti-technology. I'm just saying we need, to, we need to think carefully about what we're doing because I, I think that's going to have tremendous implications down the road for spiritual formation as well as for how we do <coughs> ministry. Because there's some way, some things that you, that I believe God will call the church to do in ministry, that cannot be done over a weekend. That it's going to, it's going to take an established, consistent, persistent presence to really affect change. And, you know, if, if we have attention deficit disorder, spiritually speaking, I mean, how are you going to be able to do that? mentor in campus ministry uh, likes to drop bombs on, on occasion just say things and just leave you standing there wondering what, what just happened um, and he told me one time he said David you are what you do with your attention 
And uh, this is, I think, one of the greatest challenges. And I was really glad to hear you start to address it this morning because I think it's one of the greatest challenges this generation faces is, is how do we grow? How do we, if we can't give sustained attention to something, right. how can we possibly expect to grow and, and, and acknowledge God in this way? So, okay. Um, well, the last, last, last question that's got two parts to it. Could you tell us um, first about, as you think back over um, your time in ministry, what has really been the high point? Uh, is there is there a moment that you think, man, that was really when, when <clears throat> things were working right? Um, this was the high point in ministry. Now, when you say in ministry, does it have to be in a pastoral ministry or just ministry in general? Because I've been a pastor for seven years it's, but it's, before that. It's however you want to take it. I would probably, well, there have been a few, but if I had to pick one that just comes off the top of my head when you ask the question, the first thing that comes to mind, when I first moved to Oakland, California back in 1989, I lived down in, um, if anybody's familiar with Oakland, California, and for those who aren't, um, there's a section of Oakland, California they call Death Valley uh, because of the crime rate and the murder rate and all these kinds of stuff. So I moved from Kankakee, Illinois, population 27,000, parents' house, <coughs> to Death Valley, Oakland, California. Uh, people were selling crack on the corner in front of the house where I was staying. And uh, I was a youth director. I didn't have an office, I had a, they gave me a closet and I cleaned it out and that became my office. It was about um, about the size of this corner from where this gentleman is um, over that way. Um, no budget, anything like that. Kids in the youth ministry were in games. And back in those days, Oakland had girl games. I would have 13 year old girls come to Bible study. I said, well, what's wrong? What's wrong? Well, they finally break down well. We was in a fight and I had a gun, I shot at somebody and I missed. And now I'm scared because I was mad that I missed. Those are the types of issues you know, we had to deal with there. And it was the best time of ministry that I can uh, think of in my life because uh, it wasn't just theory, it was discipleship like on the battlefield, the literal battlefield. I'm not talking about spiritual bullets, I'm talking about the 38 specials, that was the game that was on the street where our church was. And uh, we went and there was a church that only had like about four or five members, but they had a gym. And we convinced them to let us use their gym. And we opened up the gym, had, a, what do you call it, a drop-in center uh, from nine in the morning till nine at night hundreds of kids coming through there. I got a chance to witness uh, to people and just to see God uh, change lives and all those types of things. Very difficult time for my family because I wasn't making any money. Youth directors don't make any money. And um, had a brand new baby. My son is now 17 years old. He's a uh, freshman down at Murray State, Kentucky. Uh, and having <coughs> to strap him in the back of our uh, 1980, 1984 Buick. It wasn't a Buick. The C K it fell off. <laughs> it fell off at like 160,000 miles. So I mean, it was just. And I was there. I was there in Oakland during the earthquake. Uh, it was in October. It was in 1989. My wife was pregnant with my son. And I was there for the fire. So that was probably the highest point for me in ministry in terms of just had to completely depend on God. <laughs> Didn't know how we were going to make it because looking at our budget. Now, I'm in seminary, and the way the traffic works in Oakland, even though it was 35 miles from Mill Valley to Oakland, it took an hour and 45 minutes to drive it every day. In seminary, working full time as a youth director, bills were this much, I was making that much, the best time of my life. As you think back, over uh, your ministry, and, and I know that some of these things you probably wouldn't want to share, but as you think about uh, low points, 
would you say, wow, that was a real low point uh, for me in ministry? Probably uh, 1995, I think it was, there was a, uh, I was assistant, uh, executive assistant to my father. We had brought on a youth director. My father had a tremendous back problem that required surgery. Uh, this guy that we brought on as youth director was a friend of mine. We went to law school together. And we started noticing certain things, you know, couldn't really get a handle on it. Make a long story short, the day after my father went in for surgery uh, for his back, this guy comes into my office saying that, you know, uh, he really is, uh, he really thinks that the church is going in the wrong direction and that our doctrine is off and that the Lord has sent him here to help us get straight, and so on and so forth. So just that treachery, I mean, because my father treated him like a son and he had opportunities to share whatever he wanted to share, but he waited for my father to get down. And then he tried to rise up, and he actually tried to pull a coup and uh, took, I forgot how many members, and then tried to go start another ministry. So that was very disheartening, um, just to have somebody up that close, you know, to turn uh, like that, and to be disloyal to um, my father, you know, who happened to be my pastor as well. So that was probably a low point for me. Remarkable how many pastors share times of betrayal yeah. like that are really the, the times are the most painful yeah. and most difficult. Yeah. I've, uh, just to add, secondly, I've just had um, a situation this year where a staff member I had to let go was a sort of a, a form of betrayal. Well, not sort of, it was actual a betrayal, and uh, you know, I confronted them about some situations that they had lied about, but the rest of the congregation <coughs> sort of knew about and stood up and. Sort of try to hold the person accountable, but thanks be to God, I was able to deal with that situation with a whole lot more grace because I had been through the previous situation, so I didn't take it personally. You know, I knew that you know, this is part and parcel of you know that's one of the benefits if you take it as a benefit. That's one of the benefits of growing up in a pastor's house is that you can see some things so that when it comes when it comes your turn. You know, you're not completely thrown out, uh, blown out of the water because you recognize, okay, that's part of the process. That's part of how this thing works. Because Paul warned in Acts chapter 20, okay, men are going to rise up in your midst to try to draw disciples off after them. And a lot of things don't make sense in Scripture until you start pastoring. <laughs> like, have you read in those passages in Philippians where it talks about, you know, Paul said that. Uh, you know, some are preached, some uh, have been emboldened by my imprisonment so that they preach the gospel more freely, but then others are preaching out of envy. That doesn't make sense. You know, why would somebody be preaching to make it hard for you? Wait till you start pastoring. You'll understand that. You'll understand that. Some stuff you can't understand until you start pastoring. Well, okay, it's time to, I would like to just remind everybody there's plenty of food left, and so if you, if you want seconds, feel free to to get up and, and grab seconds. But uh, let's go ahead and open it up to questions um, from you guys. We've got, we've got about 20 minutes uh, for questions. Yes, sir. Last question. So uh, let's say that you're looking at hiring a new pastor at your church. What types of things are you looking for in terms of character or experience or temperament? Um, what what come to your mind as far as the top things you're looking for? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. And you, you hit it. Uh, the first thing is character. Uh, the thing that I look for uh, when I'm going to hire somebody is uh, honesty, integrity. I mean, uh, obviously you have to have some kind of, let me put it to you this way, and then I'll answer it more directly. Everybody I've hired at the church has had to work at whatever they're doing for six months free before we hire them. Because if they don't want to do it for free, you know, then what are we paying you for? Are you just here? We, we can't pay you because you need a job. We, we need to pay you so that you can do the job, and we're paying you so you won't have to go someplace else, you know, to make a living. And so 
one of the things I look for when we talk about this issue of character, and this is straight from you know Timothy, First Timothy three, and some other scriptures. You're looking at things in terms of what's their what's their appetite. You know, what do they feed on? That is to say, if they can't, what is their devotional life like? You know, pray with them. What do they pray about? You know, you can really find out a lot about a person if you pray with them over a span of time to see, you know, where, where is their heart? What do they like to feed on? What is their conversation like when they have the opportunity to talk about whatever they want to talk about? And this is one of the things that I prescribe. Keep, Charlie said this uh, earlier to, to me today while we were sitting there, uh, because he remembers this. Keep a joker talking. If you want to find out what is really going on in a person's heart, keep them talking. Keep them talking, because eventually, what's in them is going to come out of them. That's how Columbo, a monk, and all the great <laughs> things, right? That's how they, that's how they get it. Is Columbo, is that outside of your random experience? Okay, Columbo, that's how he, he'll just be talking about nothing. You know, my wife, you know, she said this, blah, blah, blah. He just keeps them talking until they, you know, either get aggravated or they drop their guard down. And then as he's getting ready to go out the door, he's, oh yeah, one more thing. Where were you? You know, and he has because if you keep a person talking, their true character, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So appetite is one thing. That is to say, you know, are they in Bible study themselves? You know, what is their devotional life like? What is their conversation like? What do they like to feed on? Uh, do, do they know a lot of gossip? Do they know a, a whole bunch about other folks' business? Okay, well that lets you know something about their what? Appetite. Yeah. Obviously, integrity in terms of like, do they, do they do what they say they're going to do and will they show up on time? That's important. I mean, if you're supposed to meet at 1245 and they're always late, well, you know, that's the issue. So character is the key component, and you are, are correct in suggesting that that ought to be the first thing. You also said, like, temperament as well as gifts. I think, from my perspective, and again, I've been pastoring for seven years, but I was an, an administrator in a church for <clears throat> eight years in a small church, and then two years in a mega church in Chicago, and then what, another three years in a church out in Oakland. And what I've found is... If you can find the person who has the right character and a willingness to learn, you'll be better off than somebody who has gifts but not character. Because you can teach certain skills, you know, until they have some kind of aptitude. Now, they have to have a baseline aptitude. You know, if they don't know how to turn a computer on, I mean, it's going to be hard to teach them you know, how to do the budget, you know, the church song. But if they have some kind of baseline aptitude, but they're willing and they got the right character, that's going to go much further than having somebody who has all the gifts, but there's some character flaws that you say, well, I can work through that. No, you'll be better off going ahead and taking the time to raise this one up, in my opinion. That's been my experience. I hope that answers. Yeah, thank you. You don't start asking questions, I'm going to start asking questions. If we've got a student ready, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. Um, I just had a question about how, how it was shepherding your family to go from a prestigious career in law, where you make a lot of money, you know, you're living a comfortable lifestyle, to going into ministry where, you know, the, the money's not going to be the same. That's an excellent question. I'm very glad they you only ask excellent <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad you asked. Prayer. I mean, it's it's um, you know you read the Bible and God told Abraham or told Abram to go do this and that. So next time you see it, the Bible leaves out a lot of stuff <laughs> because I mean, in the grand scheme of things and in the meta narrative, I mean, it's not really that important. But the truth of the matter is, practically speaking, uh, and this again is my philosophy. This is my experience. I've always. Um, I've always prayed to God that if you want me to do something and you want me to move, I need you to speak to my wife so that she's not just going out of a sense of obedience or, you know, 
godly submission that, that she's going as a partner. Because I don't want us to get down the road and it starts becoming difficult and then, you know, their resentment start building up and all these types of things. And God has given me grace in that regard. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. When I say prayer, I'm not just, I'm not talking about now laying down to sleep. Oh yeah, Lord bless my wife and help her to see what, no. I'm talking about fasting and prayer. Anybody understand fasting? Did I talk about that earlier? I'm talking about you really got to get in God's face and say, well, now Lord, if you really want me to do this, the, you, you need to help the rest of the family to see what you're showing me. And it's been my experience and my observation as I've seen others do that, that he will do that. Now, depending on your temperament and your family's temperament, your spouse or the rest of the family, that might be overnight, that might take a few years. But I believe that it's extremely important because I don't believe that God has called us to conflicting ministries. I think he's called us to concentric ministries. My first ministry is to my wife and my family because uh, there are other pastors, and she only has one husband. Uh, there are other preachers, but my children only have one dad. So I got to concentrate where I'm the exclusive. And so with that frame of thought, I, I don't just make decisions, you know, <clears throat> unilaterally. You know, I try to uh, make sure that I'm being prayerful and get all the information and, and more importantly, listen to what they have to say so that even if I do have to make the final decision, say, well, you know, no, we're going, that they cannot say, well, I was not heard. They need to feel like they're being heard if they have some disagreements or they have some uh, fears about that. When I moved from, um, from it wasn't a big jump moving from law to um, law to the ministry because I got married sort of in between there. That is to say, when my wife married me, we got married August the 5th. We started seminary August the 17th. So she didn't have any chance to get used to a certain standard of living. We came in poor, so everything has been up since. since <laughs> so I'm good. But uh, when I, went, I used to work in Chicago at a, a big church uh, there, and then moving from Chicago to Rockford, I took a $25,000 pay cut. And so I, sh can I say show enough? Do you know what that means? Okay, so I show enough had to. <laughs> I still not had to pray and ask God. It, it's, it's strange. When I first went to Rockford, when we pulled up to the church where I'm now pastor for the first time, a friend of mine asked me to come and preach. I didn't want to go. We had just got established. I'm cutting the story short. And so the first thing my wife said was, I hope the Lord don't call us here. I said, baby, we just, I'm just coming to preach. She said, preach, you going on back to the house. We don't even have to stay. You know? And so went in and preached and you know, went on back home. Got to praying, and they asked me to come again, and she was nervous. Oh, I don't want to go to Rock. I don't want to go. I said, baby, they just asked me to come preach. I'm going to go over there and see. When it came and preach, whatever. And so when it became obvious that they were going to call me, I said, Lord, I mean, I, I got in the prayer closet. I said, Lord, and you, you've heard what she said, and I'm hearing what you said. Now, y'all got to work this out. <laughs> I ain't going to be fighting either one of y'all. <laughs> But definitely not you. <laughs> you know, so I prayed and prayed and it showed you how the Lord worked. We prayed in the church where I pastor. My wife's primary concern was, I mean, we have young children and she wanted a disability. You know, we had just bought a house in Bolingbrook. By God's grace, the church that I pastor now, before they called me, they bought a house. A very nice house. And so uh, the deacons, they met me and said, now, Pastor, we know you got a young family, you know your wife, and one of my chief deacons right now, he said, we know, we understand the principle, because he's an older gentleman, we understand the principle that if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> I said, okay, well these guys are full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, they said, we want you to bring your wife next time. They brought, my wife, my wife came to Rockford, and they said, let us take her to go see the house. She saw the house before I did. So, they took her to the house, she came back all smiles. <laughs> and uh, it was like that, like that joke, uh, they tell, uh, uh, they was calling a guy to a new pastorate and uh, they offered him a, a tremendous uh, signing bonus, come, we'll give you $50,000, so on and so forth. And so somebody called uh, the pastor's home, one of the people from the, uh, 
committee called the pastor's home. His child answered the phone. He said, well, uh, may I speak to the pastor so-and-so? He said, no. He says, he's upstairs praying. He said, well, when we speak to your mother, he said, no, she downstairs packing. <laughs> so while I was praying, <laughs> after she saw the house, she started packing. <laughs> but my point is, only God could have done that. God still has the king's heart as well as your spouse's heart in his hand, and he can turn it, you know, whether it's so he will, just like <laughs> channels of water. But you got to be respectful. So, you know, talk and pray, and God will help you make those transitions. <clears throat> How did you make the decision to move out of the inner city? And what would you say to people who think maybe it's a good idea for me to just go into the city? It'll be a hard life. There'll be danger to my family. You know, terrible things could potentially happen, but I'm going to do this for the gospel. How, how would you counsel somebody who wants to be a light in the city, but who sees those dangers as well and has a family and that sort of thing? Another excellent question. Uh, the first question was, how did I decide to move? I didn't want to. I mean, uh, I was working at Rock of Ages Baptist Church, which is in Maywood, Illinois, um, and we were doing, as a church, doing tremendous ministry there in Maywood, actually uh, making a difference. I honestly did not want to uh, leave there, but uh, God called me to where I am, and I'm, I'm, I'm with the best people in the world, and I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that he called me there, and we're looking to do great things there as well. But for somebody who feels that they're called to uh, say an urban setting call to inner city uh, ministry. Let me just admonish you having, again, lived in Oakland uh, with a, a little child and then living, uh, working in Maywood, all those types of things. At some point, you gotta ask yourself, do you really believe this? I mean, is this worth dying for? I believe it is. And I believe that doing God's will is worth inconveniencing the people that I love and even if it comes to it, asking them to partner with me in something that others might perceive to be risky. Because I believe that the kingdom is, is worth that much. And it, but again now, I, I'm kind of cognizant and sensitive to my family. And I, I, I need to let them express their concerns, their fears, and all those types of things. But I made up in my mind a long time ago when I decided that I would follow Christ, that if he sent me to the furthest corners of the world, I don't care. As long as this happens, and this is my daily prayer, Lord, as long as you keep your hand on me, I don't care what else happens. If I, if this church kicks me out, if he keeps his hand on me, see, I left the, my, my uh, senior partner is an agnostic from the law uh, firm that I was with in Kankakee, Illinois. He's an agnostic Jew, however that works, I don't know. He still thinks that this is just a phase and that one day I'll be back because he counts me as a son in the law. And he anticipated that I would take over the firm. To this day, I mean, if I called him right now, he said, okay, you ready? <laughs> I'm, not I'm not coming back. <laughs> you come to Christ and come on up here with me. <laughs> we have that conversation. I mean, regularly. I made up in my mind when I said, yes, I'm going to go into the ministry that I was abdicating my right to say how God would use me. Mm -hmm. Bible says this, in a great house, you read this before, 2 Timothy chapter 2, in a great house there are many vessels, some for honor, some to dishonor, you know, so on and so forth. In a great house, the master of the house gets to decide how the vessels are used. And so if he wants to use me, you know, in, uh, on the south side of Chicago, if he wants to use me in Gray's Lake, if he wants to use me in Lagos, Nigeria, if he wants to use me in Los Angeles, that has to be decided on the front side of ministry. If you win this thing because you think that somehow or another, you know what, I'll start with a smaller church and then I'll do well and they'll bump me up. Get out, because you're messing it up for everybody. We don't need any, uh, what do you call these, mercenary missionaries people who are going to the highest bidder. If you're in this thing and you're in it for real, then that means you've got to be able to be willing to go anywhere and recognize that wherever you go, it's only God, listen, it's only God that's protecting your family where you are right now. 
And if he called you, wherever he calls you, he's going to make provisions and he's going to give you protection. Listen, I'm talking about in Oakland, girl game shooting. I'm talking about 38 specials. Never had an ounce of fear. I'm a timid person by nature. I'm a, uh, we call it, uh, somebody's talking about temperament. I'm a, what they call a high S or phlegmatic or, you know, laid back uh, type of guy by nature. I'm non confrontational by nature. But guess what? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He'll give you the capacity to do what even goes against your temperament, and you'll feel good about doing it. You'll find grace in it. That's why you asked me, because this gets back, your question ties into His first question. What was the high point of ministry when I was out there, didn't have nobody to trust but God for provision and protection? And I saw God move in people's lives. And it was the greatest experience I've ever experienced. See, if, you, if, if you're only going to do ministry where you can see how it's going to work out, where you control it, you ain't going to do much in ministry. Now, you, you might be a great manager, but you ain't going to see God do extraordinary things in ministry. Why? Because if, if you're not willing to launch out in deep water, I mean, you're not going to get very many big fish, right? But if you launch out, uh, God will give you the grace. So my counsel to, to those who might feel a calling to go to the inner city, might feel a calling to go to an urban situation, might feel a calling to go to some other foreign country where you perceive that there's danger. Listen, our king is more than able to protect you and more than able to provide for you. He's done so up to this point. What makes you think he's going to leave you now? Matter of fact, you didn't make it up to this point because you've been so careful. <laughs> yeah, you saw the accidents that you missed, but you didn't see the ten that he kept you from that you'll never know about. And so if he kept you up to this point, if you've eaten up to this point, maybe you don't know where you're going to eat tomorrow, but you had some spaghetti today, right? <laughs> <laughs> if he's kept you up till today, you know, if, they, if they're not moving your stuff out of your dorm, if, if they haven't cut anything off, then just rejoice in the Lord and just keep on moving forward. It's a quick question, kind of piggyback what you already said. When you made a decision to move from one place to another, did you um, have counsel with anyone else besides your wife? father or anyone else? Actually, let's see, did I? In this situation, when I'm, when I'm, uh, this last move I made, that is from Chicago to Rockford, I did not um, consult with others, and there was only one reason I did not. <clears throat> I'm glad you asked this question, too. What well, I, I, I don't think I mentioned it, but let me mention it here. One of the disciplines uh, that I think that uh, every Christian ought to engage in, aside from prayer and fasting, is prayer and journaling. Because when you journal, you can start seeing certain trajectories in your life. You can start seeing certain patterns in terms of how God leads. And so this last decision I had to, to make in terms of moving, I could already sense the trajectory. and. I could already sense, you know, how God was moving. And as I look back over the patterns of my life, and even now, even more so that I'm there, I can see how everything that has happened in my life has prepared me for where I am right now, you know, and prepared me to do what I'm trying to do right now. So it was so clear uh, that I didn't, but my general pattern is to seek godly counsel. I have prayer partners. You know, obviously fast and pray and all those types of things. So there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that if you journal, sometimes you'll start seeing certain things that you know will fit right along with what God has been trying to do all along. <clears throat> well, we're at the 1 o'clock hour. And so uh, our, time, yeah. our time is uh, over. But I do want to encourage you, this conversation will be happening again. Not the same conversation, but another one. Um, on Thursday. <laughs> and next time we'll be meeting at Hinkson Hall. Uh, and so I want to invite you back if you don't have formation. Thursday. But let's uh, express our thanks to the Lord for.